People ask how many shipwrecks there are in Florida water. There, there's hundreds to thousands. Okay, lost. Near shore, offshore. The new technology is what, uh, we've heard this term called paradigm shift in science, right? When you really, okay, it's like the computer, Steve Jobs and the computer. It changed the way we work. It changed the way we write, changed the way we do research. The sea searcher, okay, is going to be a paradigm shift because it's going to tell you you're not just digging up iron or excavating. See, I use that digging up again. You're not just excavating artifacts. You're, edu you're excavating something that everybody wants to find when they're out there. And as we all know, that's something called treasure. My name is Dr. Robert Baer. I'm the project archaeologist. Maritime history dates back to the Stone Age when people first made boats and rafts and canoes and started to use lakes and rivers and then the ocean and it's evolved until we have what we have today which is nuclear submarines and alvins and all the high-tech things. There's something called the Treasure Coast and people really, they hear it on the news and everything, but the Treasure Coast is really the area between uh, Fort Pierce Inlet and Sebastian Inlet, which is about 35 miles long, which has the remains of the Spanish 1715 plate fleet that was on the way from Havana back to S Spain with what's uh, often called a king's ransom of treasure. As you know, 1492, the Columbus era, then we go to 1510, we go to Pizarro and Cortez and all the explorers. And then we have these people who are searching for gold and silver. They go to Mexico and they go to South America, Ecuador and Peru, and they start to mine this silver. One of the great mines was at Potosi in Peru, which was a mountain, actual mountain of silver. And they'd mince there and they minted the coins and then they had to take the coins back to Spain. So they go back across the isthmus, across the Gulf, and they will go to Havana. A fleet from South America and a fleet from Mexico became the combined fleet at Havana, and then they reloaded the treasure there and sailed up the Gulf Stream, okay, which separates the Bahamas from Florida onto Spain. And of course, <laughs> we laugh about this. They didn't have the weather channel, so they were caught by a, a hurricane there, the 1715 fleet. Uh, nobody knows exactly how many ships there were, 9, 10, 12. There's various uh, accounts, everything. And they wrecked along that treasure coast that I just talked about, which is Fort Pierce Inlet to Sebastian Inlet, which is about 35 miles in length. The manifest of these ships, which were anywhere from 80 to 90 feet, 100 feet long, were, were carrying millions and millions of, of current dollars pesos then in treasure. Seafarers has done something called stretching the treasure coast. We found a couple new wrecks. If we want to talk about the 1715 wrecks, they were nearshore wrecks right along the beach. Actually, the real aid corporation that found these wrecks, a guy went out there on a surfboard and they could see the cannons and anchors on the bottom. It's a little different when we take the Juno wreck or ballast pile and anchors a mile out at sea and at Melbourne Beach, it's um, very difficult to see there, murky water, and we're anywhere from quarter mile to half a mile offshore and further. We've got a couple scatters there. So every shipwreck has its own signature. Every shipwreck is different. We've got the general locations like the Spanish 1715 plate fleet. But people have been looking uh, north and south for missing ships. So some 15 years ago, a scatter was found at Melbourne Beach, and there's something called quantitative artifacts, which if you study the artifact, it, it can lead you to the ship, and something was found called the Monteros Plate. It's a large silver plate, and it had a name on Isabel Montero. So if you look back in the archives, the vessel called the Concepcion, which was owned by a gentleman named Monteros. He was transporting that plate and other treasure back to Spain. So that's a, a diagnostic artifact. 
that says, you know, let me tell you something, there's probably a shipwreck and shipwreck scattered there, which there is, and that could be a missing 1715 vessel because we had the names of the other vessels and we could see that, guess what? The Concepcion was on that manifest. So that's one way of doing it. We've got the artifacts out there. What we want to do then is, are there other artifacts and scatter out there? So we do something called a magnetometer survey. And a magnetometer recognizes iron in the natural in, uh, environment. So you pull the magnetometer behind a boat and you get something called anomalies or hits. And then the second phase of that is once you find your anomaly, which is iron on the bottom, and the iron could be uh, anchors and cannons and bolts and hull nails, things like that, then you dive or verify. Then you send the divers out there. Diver, ver uh, diver verification is they go down to the bottom, they've got the handheld magnetometers. Then they sweep those handheld magnetometers on the bottom and they get hits. And then the next thing logically is you have to displace the sand, you have to dig. And when you dig, oftentimes you will encounter the artifacts or the treasure. Now, as you know, I think you've already got the interviews about this, Seafarer and Wild Manta have developed proprietary technology that can recognize other metals, iron and other metals, and you know what those metals are in the environment, and they're testing this right now as we speak. So I'm just going to say this is a paradigm shift in treasure hunting, whereas you're not just finding the iron, it's possibly you're finding other um, metals. Gold and silver. Okay, the game. Let's go back to the magnetometer survey that finds a shipwreck site. You find the anchors in the cannon. Now the sea searcher is not something that's going to travel miles and miles up and down the coast like the magnetometer. The magnetometer gets you to the ferrous or the iron materials, the cannons and the anchors, which constitutes a site. Then you bring in the big guns and the big guns are going to be are going to be the sea searcher, which surveys a much smaller area. It's not designed to go for miles and miles. It's once you've located something that you think uh, uh, <laughs> treasures there, and you say, I don't like to use that word treasure, the important artifacts, the primary cultural deposit seafarer locates those discrete anomalies there and performs that reading, as you know, then you go back to the same thing you've got to excavate. And as I say, three or four or a foot down there, that's no problem. If they're deeply buried, okay, you've got to use the standard technology or invent a new technology for uncovering those artifacts. As you come south from the Cape, the water's very murky and very dirty. A couple, three months ago, I went out there, we have a cannon out there, an iron Spanish, a 10-pounder cannon, 35 feet of water. So we dove down there because I was going to measure the cannon. We're going to put the dimensions on a worksheet, which is part of archaeology. You couldn't see from one end of the cannon to the other. You couldn't see from the muzzle to the cascabel, but we knew what it was. You could feel like the blind man feeling the elephant, you know, the old thing. So we measured it up. We got all that, but, it, but you, you would have to stumble on that almost by accident to find it, but the magnetometer had found it. Remember, it's iron, it's ferrous, it's large, it's got a signature. And as the story goes, those other artifacts I've talked about, these plates and a pistol and other artifacts were found in association with that cannon. So therefore, I'm going back to what I said again, I've got to drill this in. You find the iron artifacts, you find a shipwreck site. Now this wasn't a shipwreck site, it was a cannon which was a scattered artifact. Archaeologically, how did that cannon get there? But once we started to examine that cannon, and in the past, they had found the artifacts in association with that. And the question you asked was, how is that difficult out there? You can't see your hand in front of your face. But you can dive on anomalies. You can find cannons. You can find anchors. You can send the divers down with metal detectors. They will find more discrete artifacts. And then they will archaeologically recover. And a different thing with Seafarer, we tend to do the hard work with measuring these artifacts one from the other within a grid because that gives you a picture of a shipwreck or that discrete site. Now, as we move south from the Cape, 
okay, we go into the 1715 area on a calm day out there, it's very clear out there. In the 1960s, when the real A Corporation found those sites out there, they went out there with a surfboard and they could look down and they could see the cannons and anchors. I worked other sites like that. And they went to the state, oh, you can't do that. Okay, that belongs to the state. Those are state lands down there. They go get an admiralty attorney, they get an admiralty arrest, etc. Now moving south from the 1715 fleet sites, which is on good days, very clear, and that's what you want. We get down to Juno, Juno's in further, that's, that's great. On a clear day, you can see, and you're working in 100 feet of water, and you can see a ballast pile. And you know what ballast is, that's the rocks, that's the Spanish ships carried in the holes for stability. You can see that in a large anchor. That was known for years. So that site's different. We've done the remote sensing there, okay? Looking for iron, and I believe the search, sea searcher has been deployed there, and we're waiting for the data. So that's a different site. And, and um, I worked another site very, very close there called the Jupiter Inlet site. And that was an inlet that was dredged through in the, uh, 1925 and they dredged through the shipwreck. Okay, and they scattered all the artifacts and treasure everywhere. And that was salvaged. So each of these shipwrecks are different. One thing I do, I do reports and I do books and things like that. I'm going to use a prop here because this is a very important book. Back in 1974, the first state of Florida, a marine archaeologist, Carl Clausen, 1974, wrote this book. There's not been another book since 1974. Now, since 1974, there's been a lot of treasure magazine stories and stuff like that, but what we're looking at is trying to do something definitively with history and record that history. So. My role here, archaeologist, is to gather um, the data scientifically, and at some point what we're going to do, remember we've got that missing 1715 shipwreck, so what we've done is we've stretched the treasure coast some 18 miles north from Sebastian Inlet to just south of Cape Canaveral if we're going north. So that's important too, and then recently another 1715, we believe shipwreck has also been found off the Cape. So it's really a continuing kind of search and exploration for these shipwrecks. People ask how many shipwrecks there are in Florida water. There are hundreds to thousands, okay, lost, near shore, offshore. So my job is to gather the information, and you know what, if you don't write a book about it or you don't write an article someone's going to read, it didn't exist. Would you agree with that, maybe? I do. I do. So what you want to do is you, you want to add to the discipline scientifically or add to the story. See, I tend to use these words like add to the discipline and paradigm shift. No. It's, it's are there other missing 1715 vessels? There are. Do they even agree back in 1715 how many vessels there were? There were vessels that tagged along that weren't part of the official convoy. Where are they? Okay, and they have not definitively identified all the vessels along the Treasure Coast in that area from Sebastian to Fort Pierce Inlet. So it really is a, um, a job of getting all the facts together, crunching those facts, talking with other experts, and trying to write some sort of definitive article or book, okay, where people will learn from that. And that's the bottom line. You think? I've worked with a lot of uh, what I call salvage archaeology companies. Seafair really has done the best job. And we're gathering information all the time. And uh, you know, we've talked about the new technology and everything. Eventually, we will find the primary cultural deposit, which is a treasure. So, so this, is, um, uh, this is very, very uh, promising. That's the best word I can use, is promising okay, that we will find the treasure. What we want to say is in the treasure hunting industry, there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of bad blood, okay? We're trying to do the best we can with what we have and do this scientifically and using Wild Manta and Tim Reynolds along with Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Kennedy, I think, I, I think we've uh, achieved that paradigm shift is what I think.